I know there is a little bit of this. This is the American sports DNA, Steve. When the little conference team rolls through everybody and they get against a big conference team and get rolled, a lot of people in America are like, yeah, you guys are a bunch of phonies. But I look and I think, hell, Baylor blew through everybody in the tournament. I, I don't think Gonzaga's going anywhere. I mean, what was your takeaway on the game? Well, for starters, in terms of Gonzaga and what Mark Few has achieved, a really unprecedented level of success. And that's backed up by the analytics and the numbers. Uh, it's his second Final Four. And um, the only surprise last night to me was the convincing fashion that Baylor won the game. They really dominated from start to finish. Uh, their defense was as impressive as any title game defense as I can remember since the 1990 UNLV running Rebels under Jerry Tarkanian yep. when they dominated the Duke Blue Devils. So uh, I don't think Gonzaga is going away. Uh, they're a remarkable story. Decade after decade, they've been dominant. Uh, and on an annual basis, they challenge themselves with the most rigorous schedules in the non-conference yeah, of any team in that, the country. That's right. So uh, I, I agree with you. You know, I, I, I would say this um... – and this is funny. You would know this as a coach. Sometimes when you're so good offensively, it is a natural. You're, we're all human here. You don't play with the urgency defensively. And I do think Gonzaga at times could score so quickly, they didn't always give you a great defensive ever. Like last night, I felt to myself, listen, you picked a bad night not to be keyed in defensively. And when you were in your coaching, was it harder to push for defense the better and more talented and skilled your offenses were? Well, for starters, there's that old adage, and it's been around for a reason. You know, it's tough to be exceptional in every phase of the game. Now, last night, Baylor was an example of a team on both sides of the ball that played at a magic level. Um, they knocked down 10 threes. Uh, they have the positionless basketball on the perimeter when you look at Mitchell and Butler and Teague, those three guards for the yeah. Bears, the best perimeter attack in the country. Yeah. Um, so it is difficult uh, to be great on both sides of the ball. Uh, we see it in football on occasion. You know, Pete Carroll's USC Trojans and Nick Saban's uh, Alabama teams have had that balance offensively and defensively. Um, but I think Butler exposed some things, and nothing wrong with that. It's, it's not an insult to Gonzaga, just the personnel that um, – that Baylor has uh, exposed, uh, and mostly it was the foot speed. Yeah, uh, let's face it; they are a tough matchup. Yeah, similar to playing the Golden State Warriors. Uh, it's tough to play Golden State when they're hitting on all cylinders. Uh, a few years back, before the injuries to Clay and whatnot, but uh, but yeah, let's let's give Baylor some credit here too. Yeah, you know it, it is interesting. College basketball. I said this the other day. You better be very careful about firing your coaches in college basketball because with a transfer portal, not only will the coach be gone, the players will all leave, and you'll be starting from scratch. Give coaches an extra year or two. Steve, when Baylor's interesting, they've used the transfer portal a little bit, and I know it's a turnoff for a lot of coaches. But I look at it and I think to myself. I watched this tournament, and Baylor's got three NBA guys, and Gonzaga's got three, two, three NBA guys, and I'm like. All coaches hate the transfer portal, but I'm like, it's just a new thing. It, and it, I mean, I've never had more fun in the last 10 years watching the tournament. Did you? I actually felt at the end of it, Steve, this was a good March madness for college basketball. It showed that you could use the transfer portal and win a title and be great. I mean, I, I don't know. I just I come out of it this morning feeling better about college basketball. Well, for starters, let's take the transfer portal. Uh, that's been the biggest change in college basketball over the past few decades. You know, the early 80s, we had the clock that was implemented in the college game. 87, the three-point line. And now the grad transfer rule and the transfer portal. 1,100 names are in this year's transfer portal. That has dramatically changed the game in terms of the biggest trend. And it's a two-way street. Uh, you can reload. Yeah, with, uh, you know, poaching from other mid-major programs and, and players that either want to come back home or they like the system or style play, whatever the reason may be. And so like free agency, but in college, uh, you can elevate, improve your roster in the offseason. The downside is programs can also be gutted yeah. where they lose six or seven players. Uh, we're seeing that right now at Cincinnati and St. John's and some other schools. And uh, it puts a lot of pressure 
on staffs to be able to go out, use their relationships, their network throughout the world in this country to be able to reload um, at a level that will allow you to win games. Because you can go out and pick up a lot of transfers, but if they can't play at a high level, uh, that's not going to help your cause because at the end of the day, you've got to win games, make the tournament, and advance in the tournament to keep your job. So uh, it's a two-way street, but I agree there were some great stories mm. about transfers that found a good home and uh, helped those programs like a good trade or a good marriage. And I think overall, to your other point, uh, this was a tremendous NCAA tournament and March Madness. And, and Dan Gavitt and Mitch Barnhart uh, deserve a lot of credit with, along with the rest of the committee uh, because these were difficult conditions. So I think everyone deserves a salute uh, in college basketball on the men's and women's side. There's yeah. some great stories there on the women's side as well. Yeah, no, I, I, I've said this before. The people running sports, I like them more than I like a lot of the governors in America. <laughs> I think I think the commissioners and, you know, the NCAA always gets beaten up by the media, and I'm like, I don't know. They pulled this puppy off. I thought, I thought the men's and the women's were glorious finals. Finally, I, I got to give a tip of the cap to UCLA. Mick Cronin was not the first choice. He may have been the third. UCLA is a very glamorous program. The campus is in Bel Air. It is it is bougie and amazing, and I, you know I couldn't afford a house in the neighborhood. But I will say this, Mick Cronin, this was a tough, physical, relentless team. Were you a bit surprised how far they went in the style that really connected with those LA kids? Yeah, interestingly, uh, in mid January, I actually had my crystal ball out and. Uh, Occasionally, the projections pay off, and I had them either winning the national title or contending for a national title, and that was mid-January. So uh, I could see early that they had the pieces. Uh, what's remarkable is, you know, a short bench. Uh, they had some injuries, yeah, and that actually led to a seven-man rotation, a more cohesive approach both offensively and defensively, and I really fell in love with this UCLA team. Uh, they controlled tempo in terms of imposing a 337th rated pace or tempo, uh, but they were proficient and they worked for good shots. They'd take opportunities off their defense if they had the numbers in transition. Uh, but Johnny Juzang, I uh, love his ability to shot make and play make. And Jaime Jaquez, I mean, a blossoming star right before our eyes with his size. You can see over the top. He has a ruggedness and a toughness. I think he'll go down as one of the great Bruins of all time in the record books if he stays in school for years. Um, now, we'll have to see because in the offseason, all these kids look at their options. Tiger Campbell yeah. improved his decision-making as well. And Cody Riley performed down well. He Down low well. He was the only true big man. So this was a remarkable run to lose four straight games. Uh, stepping into the NCAA tournament and then win five straight from the first four to the final four. Uh, Mick Cronin does have the program head in the right direction. I was just impressed with how he reset his team's mindset because it's about confidence. That's not easy to do when you've lost four straight games. You trail Michigan State by 11. Yeah. Some doubts can come into play, but instead they come back, beat the Spartans, and then sprint to a final four. And maybe one of the better games in decades in college basketball right up there with the Leitner shot against Kentucky and uh, a few other games. But that UCLA-Gonzaga game was as good as it gets. Yeah, good stuff. Steve Lavin, good seeing you, buddy. Appreciate it. I thought it was the men's side, the women's side, the stories. You could embrace a lot of stuff. I thought the NCAA did a great job, and Steve Lavin stopping by to check in. And I agree with Steve. I don't think Gonzaga is going anywhere. Hi, everybody. Thanks for watching. Subscribe here to get the latest from the show. Also, be sure to check out more of the best clips from The Herd or go watch a few segments from other shows on FS1.